thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak here. This is actually a great honor and a pleasure to um, share some of our data on the plasticity and short-term reorganization in the language network. So my group is interested, as the title already says, in language networks. And we know that language is organized in large-scale networks in the human brain. This is data from a recent meta-analysis that we're currently putting together that um, groups or assembles many different neuroimaging studies uh, on different language topics. And what you can immediately see is that different language functions or operations are organized in different specialized networks that are distributed across our brain. And Successful communication and interaction requires the flexible communication interaction between these networks. Now, the key question of our research is how the brain may adapt to lesions or challenges. Lesions in the language network can be stroke-induced lesions, what we study, or tumor-induced lesions. We also study a lot of uh, so-called virtual lesions, that is perturbations induced by non-invasive brain stimulation, to the healthy brain, also in the lesion brain. And we're also interested in challenging listening conditions, for instance, speech and noise, and challenges induced by novel learning situations. So how do we study this? To map rapid redistribution, that is the flexible reorganization of the language network in response to a challenge induced by neurostimulation or whatever challenge, we're combining neuroimaging on EEG with different neurostimulation approaches. And today I will focus on two different combinations. The first is to apply longer lasting plasticity inducing neurostimulation protocols prior to neuroimaging or EEG. And then afterwards use these techniques to map lasting stimulation effects. By lasting stimulation effects, I'm referring to after effects of plasticity inducing protocols that should last approximately 30 to 60 minutes. And as illustrated here, for instance, we can use inhibitory transcranial magnetic stimulation, repetitive RTMS, over um, a specialized language area, inhibit this area for a certain time period, and then map the consequences with fMRI afterwards. With this, we can study so-called rapid short-term reorganization, that is the response of the brain or the network to a focal perturbation of a key language area. And this addresses the question how the language network may compensate for a controlled focal perturbation. So relative to the study of behavioral effects of non-invasive brain stimulation alone, this should provide insight into network effects. The second approach that I want to introduce today is the simultaneous combination of neurostimulation and fMRI to map the immediate consequences or the direct neural correlates of neurostimulation effects. And you can imagine that this is challenging if you want to combine TMS with fMRI, although possible. What we're using is TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, directly during fMRI, during learning paradigms. So you can map the impact of a stimulation protocol across the time course of your experiment. And both approaches allow for a combined investigation of stimulation-induced changes in task-related activity, so your language-related activity, connectivity, that is the functional interaction between different language areas, and relate this to stimulation-induced changes at the behavioral level. So this should provide complementary information about how the language network is dealing with either a focal perturbation or how it is responding to facilitatory neurostimulation. Now, I want to give you some examples on our recent work, both in the healthy um, young as well as in, in, in the lesion brain, and also um, some preliminary evidence for plasticity in the aging brain. In a first study that I did together with Dorothy Sauer here in Leipzig a while ago, we were interested in the adaptive plasticity in the semantic network. So we had healthy volunteers during fMRI perform semantic judgment tasks. So they had to indicate via button press whether highly frequent German nouns such as cat or computer represent natural or man-made items. So simple semantic decisions. And before that, we applied the focal um, perturbations over the left angular gyrus, which is the key area for semantic processing. And the idea was to inhibit this area for a longer time period 
and then see what happened, what may happen at the network level. So how the brain may adapt to the focal perturbation. Also had a control condition in the neighboring supramarginal gyrus and placebo stimulation. What you can see here is the TMS effect on um, semantic activity during this judgment. So this is always semantic um, stimulation of the angular gyrus um, compared to control or placebo. And um, what I found quite surprising is that we had strong network effects. So we found that TMS over the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere um, led to a decrease in task-related activity, not only in the stimulated area, but in a larger semantic network, including the anterior IFG, a key re region for semantic control, and also the posterior middle temporal gyrus. So a strong decrease in task-related activity after TMS over the angular gyrus. We also found with an effective connectivity analysis that the stimulation, so the, the disruption of the angular gyrus led to an increase in the influence of the angular gyrus on the anterior IFG. And this influence was inhibitory after stimulation. So it seems that this remote inhibition that we observe in these um, distant connected areas um, might be uh, reflected by an increase in the inhibitory connectivity. And what was interesting was that this remote inhibition was behaviorally relevant. So we found a um, correlation between the level of the individual inhibition from the angular gyrus to the anterior IFG and the TMS-induced response delay. So the stronger the individual inhibition of angular gyrus on anterior IFG, the stronger the individual TMS-induced response delay. So it seems that this remote inhibition is indeed behaviorally relevant and that um, TMS of the left angular gyrus not only decreases activity in the semantic network, but it also increases um, the inhibitory influence of um, between semantic region. And this inhibition seems to be mediated um, via this increase in the inhibitory influence. Now, nevertheless, at the group level, subjects were not strongly affected by the perturbation, which is a bit surprising given that large parts of the semantic network are inhibited by TMS. So how could we explain this um, maintenance of task performance? And one way of explaining is, this is to look at those areas shown in red here. These regions did not contribute to task performance before the um, disruption of the angular gyrus, but showed strong upregulation in response to the perturbation. And interestingly, these areas are not semantic areas, but parts of the phonological network, so posterior IFG and supramarginal gyrus, and also domain general cognitive control areas like the super, um, superior parietal lobe. So we found strong increase in task-related activity in these areas after we had inhibited the semantic network. And interestingly, the level of the individual inhibition of the angular gyrus predicted the upregulation of these neighboring SMG and SPL regions. So it seems that um, the stronger the individual inhibition, the stronger the upregulation of these um, neighboring regions. And we reasoned that this may reflect an attempt of the network to compensate for the strong disruption at the um, semantic network level. So a partial compensatory upregulation of phonological areas and domain general cognitive control areas that may have helped to maintain task function at a relatively level. So at the group level, no significant effect at the behavioral level. Of course, this is, um, remains a hypothesis to ultimately prove that this observed short-term reorganization that we have here, this upregulation of neighboring regions is really of functionally relevant. Then we would need to target these upregulated regions with an additional TMS protocols and see if this um, results in a stronger behavioral disruption. Now, in the next study that I also did together with Dorothee Sauer and Helmut Obrich from the Day Clinic here in Leipzig, we were interested in transferring this knowledge of adaptive plasticity from the healthy young to the lesioned and reorganized network. So the majority of studies that is interested in applying non-invasive brain stimulation in the lesioned brain is, of course, aiming to use this for treatment purposes to um, get better treatment outcomes. But relatively little is known about the potential of adaptive plasticity in the reorganized language network. And this was a question that we were targeting here in this study. So um, we selected a cohort of patients 
in the chronic phase after stroke, who initially presented with aphasia, but were well um, recovered at the time of the study. And as you can see here, patients were selected based on their lesion patterns. All of them had a lesion in their left temporal parietal cortex with the strongest overlap at the level of the supramarginal gyrus, and they had an intact frontal cortex. They had to come three times and undergo um, three fMRI sessions with TMS before, so they were well recovered at the time of the study. And during fMRI, they performed the same semantic task that we used in the healthy volunteers, that is natural or man-made decisions. And we also had a phonological task, that is syllable judgments, um, judging per button press, whether a highly frequent word has two or three syllables. And before that, we applied TMS in different sessions, either over the anterior part of the IFG, which is the core region for semantic processing, or over the posterior part, which is the core region for phonological processing. And we also had a placebo condition, so an ineffective um, baseline stimulation. And afterwards, in the scanner, subjects then performed these two tasks. Um, our first interesting result was a nice behavioral dissociation of the TMS effect. So what you can see here is the TMS effect on response speed. Interestingly, we did not find anything on at the level of task accuracy, which is not uncommon. In most of our studies, I see changes in response speed. Accuracy is um, usually less affected. So what do we have here? We have task-specific behavioral effects, that is a functional anatomical double dissociation between the two tasks and stimulation side. So that is um, TMS over the posterior IFG selectively affected the phonological task, so led to a strong increase, a delay in the phonological response speed, whereas TMS over the anterior IFG selectively delayed the semantic response speed. And this is interesting because it shows preserved functional specialization in the left IFG. So we know from healthy subjects that there is this functional specialization with the anterior part being specialized for semantic processing, the posterior part being more related to phonological processing. And we can see that also in these patients with lesions in their temporal parietal cortex, this functional specialization remains preserved. Now, what we were more interested, of course, is the effects of the stimulation at the network level. For the sake of time, I will focus here on the phonological task, which also had the more interesting results, I think. So um, what you can see here is the effect of the um, perturbation of the posterior IFG on the phonological um, task um, activity. And everything in, shown in gray here is masked out because at least one patient had a lesion here. And you can see that TMS had a, had a relatively focal effect on a decrease or inhibition of task-related activity um, during phonological decisions. So relatively focal, meaning that mainly the stimulated area was inhibited, but also some um, domain general um, midline structures like the pre-SMA. Now, the more interesting part is the reverse contrast. So those areas that show a stronger contribution after inhibition of the posterior IFG. The direct contrast did not show anything, but we found that when we used a regression analysis that the individual TMS-induced response delay predicted the upregulation of the contralesional supramarginal gyrus, so the lesion homologue. So remember that the strongest lesion overlap was at the level of the left supramarginal gyrus, and now we found that the stronger the TMS-induced response delay after inhibition of the posterior IFG, the stronger the upregulation of the contralesional right SMG region. And now the question is, of course, what does this mean? We reasoned that this upregulation of the right SMG may reflect an attempt of the network to compensate for the large perturbation in the left hemisphere by the combined lesion plus focal perturbation, which would speak in favor of an adaptive role of the contralesional homologous region. Why should this be adaptive? Of course, again, we didn't really prove this by applying a second virtual lesion over this area and seeing if this further disrupts task performance. But we already know from some of our previous studies in healthy volunteers that when we apply TMS over the right SMG during the very same task, then we get um, a strong perturbation. So it seems that the right SMG makes an active 
and um, meaningful contribution to syllable judgments. And that's why we reasoned that this most likely reflects compensation. And if this were the case, then this would speak towards an adaptive role of the right hemisphere, at least in an, as an immediate response to a focal perturbation in the lesioned but reorganized brain. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, we were here also interested in the structural underpinnings of this right hemispheric contribution. And we looked at the tract integrity of different right hemispheric tracts and found that the tract integrity as measured with um, fra fractional anisotropy of the right superior longitudinal fascicle was negatively correlated with the TMS induced delay in phonological response speed. That is the stronger the individual tract integrity of the um, right SLF as indicated by higher FA values, the weaker the TMS induced disruption. And again, this would speak in favor of an adaptive role of the contralesional hemisphere here. Of course, I'm not going to suggest that this um, tract integrity is changed by a single session of TMS. This is more likely to be to indicate a certain robustness, uh, individual differences um, in the robustness against the per focal perturbation effect. So um, put together, I think we may have some evidence here that also the lesion but reorganized language network and chronic, chronic post-stroke aphasia um, shows a way of um, adaptive plasticity by upregulation of right hemispheric homologous regions. And this would support some of um, the lesion literature and um, uh, fMRI studies in post-stroke aphasia. Now, based on these TMS studies and many more from different groups, I have recently suggested a novel model for flexible redistribution in the language network. And this model um, makes two main suggestions. That is compensation for disruption, mainly induced by TMS, can take place either within a, um, specialized networks or across different networks. So for compensation within networks, I assume that perturbation of a key language area, for instance, by a virtual lesion induced by neurostimulation. But of course, this is a model that should also transfer maybe to stroke induced lesion, decreases ta the task related uh, brain activity or the task related contribution of this area. Now the brain may adapt and maintain function by an upregulation of the remaining network regions. So those areas that also contribute to the task might simply work harder to still be able to perform the job. And this would speak towards a certain robustness of the network. Now, alternatively or additionally, we may also observe a shift of the functional weight towards other areas of the network. These may be regions that may have been sub-threshold before the um, perturbation and now just increase their contribution a little bit. And um, as shown in the patient data, we may also observe an upregulation of homologous regions. So in case of language um, and disruption of the left hemisphere of right hemispheric homologous regions that may now show a stronger contribution. And the idea is that such compensation via plasticity within networks helps to maintain task function at a relatively high level. So this seems to be a rather um, adaptive process. Now, coming to the second um, mechanism, the compensation between different networks or across networks, here the idea is that if we have strong network disruption, as I showed in the first study on the semantic network, then we have maybe decreased activity on a larger network level. So these areas cannot um, show compensatory upregulation because their contribution is downscaled. Now the brain may adapt by recruitment of alternative networks. Alternative networks may be neighboring networks for other specialized functions, as for instance, in the semantic network, a stronger contribution of phonological regions. And we often also observe recruitment of domain general networks. Domain general functions such as attention, working memory, or cognitive control are known to support all higher level cognitive processes such as language. And a stronger contribution of these areas may help to maintain task function at a certain level. This is also um, reported in a number of studies in post-stroke aphasia during, during language recovery. So we have some reasons to assume that their contribution may be beneficial for maintenance or regaining um, task performance or um, recovery of language function. 
And of course, one key assumption is that um, compensation between different networks is less effective than compensation within a network because it is unlikely that the loss of a specialized function may be fully replaced or compensated by other um, networks specialized for other functions. One question that I'm very interested in, since I'm mainly working with inhibitory neurostimulation to kind of um, simulate a lesion, is how facilitatory neurostimulation may influence the interaction between language-specific and domain general areas. And this is um, something that we um, observed in, a, in the next study that I'm going to show you. And so for the rest of my talk, I want to focus more on the role of or potential contribution of these so-called domain general areas to language um, processing. And um, in one study that I did together in collaboration with Paola Marangolo and her lab in Rome, we were interested in the neural correlates of TDCS induced improvements in verb learning. So um, to get improvements in healthy volunteers by TDCS, you need a certain challenge induced by your task. And our idea was, since this was a German-Italian um, collaboration, to have healthy subjects in the scanner perform a verb learning task on low-frequent Italian verbs. So um, those subjects didn't have any knowledge of the Italian language, and the task was relatively challenging. During fMRI, they, they saw pictures of actions. So this is something like to blow, called Sofiare. And they just saw the picture and had to overtly name the correct verb. And afterwards, they received written feedback and the learning took place in the scanner. So outside the scanner, there was just a short training session where we had um, combinations between word and pictures and they simply had to read out the corresponding names. We didn't care about the pronunciation. It was just that they um, either produced a word and if this was correct, um, the pronunciation didn't matter. What you can see here is the data from the learning session, so already during fMRI in the scanner. And here we had two sessions with two lists with either placebo stimulation or anodal TDCS. And the idea is that anodal TDCS may facilitate um, the learning process. We applied stimulation over the left um, IFG, so which should be engaged and should be relevant for verb learning. And what you can see here is that this is the repeated presentation of the different um, verbs that subjects were able to perform the task and you see a nice learning curve in both sessions. So both under sham stimulation and anodal, but we had a significant increase in task accuracy in the late learning session under anodal stimulation. So it seems that anodal stimulation improved um, verb learning accuracy here. I should mention that 50% doesn't really mean chance because it was not something like a button press decision, but they had to come up with the full correct verb here. Now the question is, how does this accuracy relate to a task related activity? Um, what you can see here is um, the effects of a nodal TDCS on task related activity during the verb learning task. So I remodulated simply the whole uh, full learning session here. And you can see that we found decreases in the task related activity under a nodal stimulation in a larger network of language related areas and also some domain general areas. So decreases in task related activity under stimulation in the left IFG that was the stimulated area in the contralateral homologous regions in the fusi fusiform gyrus, which is also related to um, verb learning and also in a number of domain general areas. I first found that surprising because I always thought more is better. So if I facilitate processing, I should get more um, activity. Then I had a closer look at other TDCS, facilitatory TDCS studies in the scanner. And this is exactly what they're showing. And the idea is that the decreased task-related activity under nodal TDCS in language areas and also domain general areas should reflect increased processing efficiency. So it's easier to perform the task. This would also be in line with a number of um, studies in, um, that show in post-stroke aphasia that after successful therapy, we show um, less activation in this language-related area, which likely reflects increased processing efficiency. Now, we were also interested in changes in the task-related interactions or connectivity between the stimulated area and the rest of the brain. 
And we found TDCS induced decrease in effective connectivity, so in the functional task related interaction between the stimulated left IFG and um, a cognitive control region in the right insular cortex. So it seems that T TDCS not, not only decreases the task related activity in a number of regions, but also the interaction between a language specific and the cognitive control region. And the decreased connectivity pattern predicted the task related improvement. So the stronger the individual decrease in connectivity, so less interaction between language and cognitive control region, the um, higher the increase in individual accuracy. And this is interesting because it shows that anodal TDCS decreases the interaction between a language specific area and a domain general cognitive control area, which is of behavioral relevance because it is related to increased processing efficiency as shown in the um, higher level of task accuracy. So it seems that um, during better learning conditions when we facilitate learning, this is not only related to changes or so to less activity in the um, respective network, but also to um, decreased interactions or connectivity between language specific and cognitive control areas. Now, finally, I want to focus a bit more on domain general area, um, networks or on one network um, especially, and that is the default mode network. So the default mode network is this so-called task negative network. And um, one area in the default mode network I'm particularly interested in is the inferior parietal lobe, because it is also associated with a number of human defining cognitive domains. And among these are attention, social cognition, and language. And in a study that my PhD student Ole Numsen and I did together with Danilo Stock from Montreal, we were interested in the role of the inferior parietal lobe in across these different cognitive domains. And if we could show hemispheric specialization for these different cognitive operations. So we had an fMRI study um, where subjects performed um, during different sessions social cognitive um, semantics and attention tasks. So we had repeated sessions with the same subjects where we had all tasks um, repeated across different sessions to have more power. And we um, could derive a task-based parcellation of the larger IPL region into two sub-regions um, in both hemispheres. So an anterior region and a posterior region. And now the interesting part of this study is that these subregions differed with respect to their predictive relevance um, for the different cognitive domains. So we found that for attention here, we had an attentional reorienting a Posner task. The um, right IPL um, subregion in the anterior part had the strongest predictive relevance of task related activity for the attentional domain relative to the other two domains. And whereas in the language task, we found that the left anterior IPL subregions had the strongest predictive relevance of task related language activity. And finally, the social cognition task was strongest associated with both po um, posterior IPL subregions. So this shows that although um, the IPL is um, part of this larger default mode network, we can show a specific um, functional contribution that differs um, with respect to different subregions for this three cognitive domains. And what was also different here was the connectivity profile, so the specific connectivity profile for each of the three domains. This is an illustration of the social cognitive task, which was a theory of mind task, where we found that both posterior IPL subregions showed increased task related connectivity that was stronger for social cognition relative to semantics and um, attention task, um, with a number of um, uh, large scale brain networks that have been described at, re at rest. And, among these networks were also regions, other regions from the default mode network. So it seems that during the social cognition task, there is a strong interaction of this posterior IPL subregions with large scale brain networks that we know from resting state fMRI. And I think this nicely shows um, that even though um, this area is um, assigned to a domain general network, it has also some very specific roles and um, these roles change also in the interaction with other brain networks depending on the task. 
Now, um, what we just started is to use this for network stimulation approaches. So what we want to show is the domain specific and domain general effects of inhibitory neurostimulation over these different subregions. And the prediction is that disruption of the IPL might differentially affect task related activity, connectivity profiles, and hopefully also behavior. And this might um, get give additional insight into the role and the functional relevance of the IPL across these do um, cognitive domains. Now, we were stopped by the pandemic with our neurostimulation study here. So we recently reanalyzed this data with a more bottom-up data-driven approach where we were taking the whole brain into account. This is work done by my postdoc, um, Katie Williams. And she was especially interested in the network interactions um, between um, at the whole brain level during these three cognitive domains. And these plots um, look a bit scary, but um, the key message here is simple. So she used an, uh, she combined an independent component analysis, which um, gave a cross task, which um, led to identification of 11 different networks. And that was combined with correlational PPI approaches to look at the task specific connectivity profiles between these identified networks. So what you can see here that many of these networks um, are um, resembling those networks that we know from REST, but we have also task specific networks like the semantic network. And now um, the basic pattern that I um, want to illustrate here is that we found increases in network interactions with increased cognitive complexity across domains. So the attention task, which was a relatively simple task, shows relatively few network interactions when contrasted against, against both other domains. There's already an increase in the complexity for the semantic task, which was um, a lexical decision task. And finally, the social cognition task, the theory of mind tasks, shows the most complex pattern of network interaction that um, includes a strong contribution of the um, frontoparietal control networks. So the idea is here is that with increased cognitive complexity of the task domains, that this is reflected in the connectivity patterns between these different networks. And of course, now it would be super interesting to see how the perturbation of um, the IPL region changes these connectivity patterns at rest and also, of course, during these tasks. So um, where's this leading? This is um, an illustration from a recent review or opinion paper that I did together with um, Lucas Foltz. And here we were interested in the previous neurostimulation studies that combined TMS with resting state fMRI and focusing on the default mode network. So what previous uh, studies show is that stimulation of the IPL region um, in induces large scale changes in resting state connectivity, not only within the default mode network, but also across different networks and also affects for instance, cognitive control regions. So it seems that there are strong remote stimulation effects across networks after IPL stimulation. Now, the question is, what is the behavioral relevance of these findings? And that's, that is something that we want to address by combining IPL stimulation with, uh, with a task afterwards. So what we're interested in is the effects of neurostimulation on task-related activity and connectivity. Um, and the question is if we can dissociate domain specific contributions of different subregions from domain general effects that might be independent of the cognitive domain. And I think that on the long run, this may have some translational relevance because um, it seems that stimulation of the IPL in, um, induces large scale network effects and many disorders can be actually considered as network disorders. So if we better understand how this manipulates the network interactions, we might use this in the future for therapeutic purposes. Now, finally, as an outlook, I want to show you a last study where we were interested in interactions and neuroplasticity in the aging brain, because the model that I suggested was mainly based on neurostimulation studies in healthy young volunteers. And I'm also very interested in plasticity or changes in adaptive plasticity and short-term reorganization across the adult lifespan. So from the healthy young 
to the aging to the lesion brain. And this is a study that um, Sandra Martin, a, a PhD student, did um, um, and I did together with Dorothee Sauer again. And here we were especially interested in the interactions between domain general networks in the aging brain during um, different language production tasks. So we had two cohorts, healthy young volunteers and an aging cohort. And we found that um, when we did a semantic fluency task, so a standard neuropsychological task and a simple counting task, that we had differences in task related activity between the younger and the older subjects. And these resembled what is known from the literature, namely a stronger contribution of domain general networks, especially the multiple demand network for cognitive control in the aging brain. So this is what was relatively expected. What may be more interested is that we, um, interesting is that we also saw differences in task-related connectivity. So this is the task-related connectivity for the older subjects during the semantic task and the counting task, so fluency versus counting. And you can see that we have strong um, interactions, network interactions, especially between the multiple demand network and the default mode network. So here, this is a seed region in the right insula. Um, and this showed increased task-related connectivity with areas from the default mode network during the semantic fluency task. And also already during the very simple counting task, a key region of the default mode network in the precuneus showed increased task-related uh, connectivity with numerous other brain regions, among which um, there were a, a lot of nodes from the multiple demand network. So it seems that in the, especially in the aging brain, there is a strong contribution of these domain general networks and especially of the multiple demand network. Now, the most interesting finding I think from this study was that we had um, age specific differences in the behavioral relevance of the coupling between these domain general areas. So we found that increased interaction between domain general networks in the aging brain was associated with worse task performance. And this is interesting because um, the effect that we saw in the young brain was flipped in the aging brain, namely an increase in the between network connectivity between the multiple demand networks, so this network for cognitive control, and the default mode network, this so-called task negative network, that's also overlap with semantic functions, was associated with better performance, so higher task accuracy in healthy young adults. And this effect was reversed in the aging brain, namely increased connectivity was related to worse performance, worse um, uh, task accuracy. And the same pattern was found for the response speed for the connectivity within the default mode network. So um, increased within default mode connectivity was related to faster, so more efficient um, responses in the young brain. And this pattern was reversed in the aging brain. So um, increased within default mode connectivity led to worse performance prolonged response speed. And we think that this likely reflects a general de-differentiation in the aging brain. So reduced efficiency in processing and reduced specificity because the overall contribution of language specific area was also decreased in the aging brain. And um, what where this leading to is, um, the, is the question how the elderly subjects might react to um, stimulation and in this case facilitatory stimulation of the multiple demand network and if this may change if, if the contribution or the response to facilitatory stimulation may depend on age years so this is something that we are getting more and more interested in because we also want to use stimulation of the multiple demand network in patients with post-stroke aphasia and see if this might be a treatment option. And of course, the first step is to see how the network may react to this. Now with this, I'm at the end of my talk and I want to briefly summarize what I hope I have outlined here about short-term reorganization and adaptive plasticity in the language network. So I, the idea or the model is that we have two basic mechanisms of compensation in the language network um, for focal perturbations. And one of these mechanisms is compensation via recruitment of neighboring or homologous regions, so within network compensation. And the second mechanism is compensation across networks 
uh, via recruitment of domain general regions or neighboring networks for other specialized cognitive functions. And we have some evidence for both we find that during large network inhibition in the healthy young brain, we observed upregulation of neighboring regions, and this seems to help or may help to maintain task function at a relatively high level. Now, um, we also often observe upregulation of homologous regions, which may help to maintain function also in the lesion and reorganized brain. We observed similar patterns also in healthy young volunteers in a previous study that I didn't present here. Now, <clears throat> with respect to um, facilitatory neurostimulation, we have some first evidence that um, this may result in increased um, processing efficiency and uh, decreases the interaction between domain um, specific language areas and domain general networks or regions. And with respect to the role of domain general areas, I think they may have a supportive role that is increased cognitive control, attentional or working memory resources, which may help to maintain function and potentially also recover function after loss of function. So it seems that domain general regions are uh, potential target candidates for uh, targeted network stimulation. And here I'm especially interested in target areas in the multiple demand network, so for cognitive control processing, and also in the default mode network, especially the IPL as a densely connected hub that might change interactions largely distributed in the brain across networks. And finally, with respect to age-dependent um, changes in, uh, in, in network interactions and their behavioral relevance, we saw some first evidence that there may be age-dependent differences in the network um, interactions, especially between, uh, in the between network interactions between different um, domain general networks that may be of functional relevance. And here, neurostimulation might also provide new insights in the future. So with this, um, I'm at the end. I want to thank you for your attention and I want to thank all my collaborators and my great group. And I'm looking forward to um, answering your questions now. Great, thank you very much. What a wonderful talk. Uh, as always, we have the audience globally clapping for you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Um, let me just... Let I was just typing a question, Giza. So a question for yourself. Yeah, for <laughs> myself, so that I'm reminded of my own question. They, <laughs> that's how much of an airhead I am. I need to type what I think, otherwise I lose it. Anyway, we have questions in the chat box. Uh, first from uh, Kirana Tsapkini. Um, thanks for this excellent and thought-provoking talk. We have found the same decreases with TDCS at the stimulated area and between connected areas in primary progressive aphasia. Wow, yeah. What do you think these decreases mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it depends. So I think if you, in, in our case, it was relatively simple because we had the same subjects under placebo and under nodal stimulation. In primary progressive aphasia, um, it depends. So it would be interesting to know if, if the stimulation results in better task performance. So um, if you can um, manipulate some of their cognitive resources by the stimulation, then this may also reflect increased efficiency, I would say. But I think without knowing the behavioral effect, it's hard to say. It would also be interesting to see if these patients are um, just diagnosed or if, they are, um, if this is a longitudinal study and see these changes um, over time. But so my guess would be if it's under a nodal stimulation and, and they are maybe even performing better afterwards, then that might also be um, increased efficiency. So less, less need for cognitive resources to perform the same operation, I would say. Thanks. Yeah, and we have a follow-up question from uh, Trisana uh, Sprungmuch. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for the talk. As a similar question to the one above, why would we see an increase in right hemisphere supramarginal gyrus when stimulating left inferior frontal gyrus mm -hmm. if we might hypothesize that connectivity has strengthened between these two areas in these patients? Yeah. 
Yeah, that is actually a good question. I have to say that I initially also expected something else. So my um, naive understanding was they have a lesion in the left SMG. Now we additionally perturb the left PFG, uh, PIFG, and what we will see is the right PIFG, a strong upregulation here. That I would find much more plausible, naively thinking, but it seems that the brain is much more complicated. So I think the right SMG may have contributed before, but maybe sub-threshold. So maybe this additional perturbation unmasked the contribution of the right hemisphere here that was there before. And here it would, of course, be super interesting to see the longitudinal data. We don't have it for these patients, but maybe um, directly after the lesion in the left SMG, there was already upregulation. That's just the speculation now of the right SMG. And now since they have recovered, they were Good, at, at a good recovery state at the time of the study, they didn't, they no longer needed a strong contribution of the right hemisphere. And now this additional perturbation of the left frontal region um, decreased the overall contribution of the left hemisphere and this unmasked the contribution of the right hemisphere again. So it is a good question. I, and I also found it a bit counterintuitive, but since we know from the healthy brain that these kind of metalinguistic phonological tasks also um, require some contribution of the right SMG, I still think that this might be a compensatory account. And I mean, um, I guess there might not be a strong connection between the lesion left SMG and the right SMG, but um, that doesn't mean that this area can't, can't contribute. So it's just the change in the net activity, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, how can we distinguish uh, between neurocompensation as a direct physiological effect of lesion or, or, or inhibition versus yeah. the purely behavioral compensation, right? So if, if an alternative behavioral strategy is just used because the task execution is impaired, how's yeah. that, how can we distinguish that from a direct physiological effect? That's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. So I think... Um, one way of addressing is to do more combined studies where we have complementary um, evidence at the behavioral level and also at the neural or neurophysiological level. So, um, but I think ultimately it's really hard to dissociate between um, the, both strategies because, um, yeah, how do we know? I, I mean, what is compensation is the other question, right? So is it just um, I think in, in the healthy brain, what I think TMS or all these neurostimulation approaches are doing is that, that they are just changing or switching the balance of the contribution of a certain area, but they're certainly not turning an area on or off. So it seems that if I inhibit one area and then see an upregulation of another area, then this decreased area is still contributing. So um, it's not that there's a lesion or cell death. So it's just that the other area is relatively more contributing. And I think it's hard to say whether this is, this is just a physiological response um, or a physiologic compensation or just an adaptation of, of the task necessities. So I don't know if we can ever dissociate it. I think what I really want to do is to target these reorganized networks. So apply one perturbation, see how the network activity changes and then targeted these new activity patterns that would at least provide some proofs that this upregulation is now of behavioral relevance. Mm -hmm. And here I think network stimulation is the key to address this, but it's of course super time consuming and requires many different steps. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have another question from uh, Kirana Tsapkini. Do you think that your results in aging could be due to the PPI seeds you looked at? Would other areas show the same pattern in younger versus older adults? Yeah, that's a good question. I have to say, I didn't show this here, but we were very selective in the um, PPI patterns because um, we only chose those seeds that were um, strong in the whole brain PPI in the, in the initial analysis for either the young or the um, aging group. So it would be totally cool to do this more data-driven. This is actually what we're planning now and um, just use a graph theory measure and a more whole brain approach and see if we can replicate this. Because I, I think it's true. It could be, we were very selective if we had 
uh, selected other selected other other nodes, we might have seen a different pattern. But um, nevertheless, I found it striking that in both groups we had these do two domain general networks that were also the most prominent networks. That's how we choose our seeds, and that it was the default mode and multiple demand seeds, and that we see this reverse in the behavioral relevance. So I'm hoping that we can replicate this once we're applying a more data-driven graph approach that um, um, will also um, take more nodes into account here. Yeah, but it's a very good question. Thank you. I was also wondering, so uh, you ended your talk uh, talking about uh, maybe the domain general sites being a good target for neuromodulation yeah. also after stroke. And I was wondering, so it may be my bias for always looking at language and therefore the perisylvian uh, cortex, but it's my impression that because of the vasculature of the brain, mm. uh, those areas may be more prone in general to uh, a stroke and the language areas, by yeah. stroke than, for example, the IPL, which would be good for your hypothesis, right? Exactly. Is that, is that your impression yeah. too, or do we actually know that? Um, I don't know if this is the case, but it would also be my guess. And that's also, um, so what we started to target before the pandemic was the um, SFG region or um, closely uh, located to the pre-SMA, so midline cortex. And this is usually, that's also what Dorothee Sauer told me, never affected by stroke. So if we want to target these areas in, in patients, then I think these targets might be even more ideal than the IPL, because sometimes the IPL is affected as well, as we found in our, I mean, we only selected patients who had a lesion in, in the posterior part. So, but this midline structures are almost never affected. So. And in principle, then we, we would be, be much less selective with respect to the patients that we could include and potentially treat here. And I mean, this idea of um, domain general network stimulation is not new. There is already a study in healthy young volunteers by Slavinska et al, who showed that this can um, improve learning. So I think it would be super interesting to see if we find any effects in, in patients with post-stroke aphasia. So we started with patients in the chronic stage after stroke who might still um, benefit from this stimulation, but this is not thought as a treatment study, but it's just um, um, a single stimulation session against placebo stimulation and a control group. And we're, of course, mainly interested in first identifying the network effects. So it's, I think that's a multi-step procedure until we reach treatment options here. Fabulous, thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of the question session, Geza. Thank you so thank much you. for your talk. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me and thanks for the great question. That was great fun. Okay, good. Well, to our audience, um, happy 2021. We hope to see you again after the break uh, on January 14th uh, for the talk by Dr. David Eagleman. And with that, good night. Good night. <laughs>